Good to be together this morning to worship God together, and it's good to have time to study His Word together. And I hope you'll be opening your Bibles to the book of 1 Peter, chapter 1, here in a moment, as we will base our lesson out of that. We, uh, uh, a couple weeks ago, I was down at the Fried Hartman Lectures, and, and the topic of the lectures that week was uh, uh, my part in history, but of course, you know, because it's, it's a, a Bible lectureship, it, it, the, the H-I-S of history was, was emphasized, and so it's also my part in his story. Uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, my alma mater, Fried Harmon, is celebrating a, a 150th anniversary this year, and so they've actually uh, been doing things all year to celebrate that, but also at the same time trying to remember we're trying to be part of, of God's story. It, you know, our story needs to be wrapped up in his story. And so what that meant is the topics that, that week that I spent there really focused around one, one word. Uh, at least that's what I took away. I guess I, I can't speak for, for necessarily the intentions of those who planned this lectureship, but one word just seemingly kept coming up over and over as we thought about our part in his story. And that word that kept coming up over and over was grace. And, you know, grace is a topic that uh, we need to make sure in the church we're discussing because really that is what his story, God's story, Christ's story is all about. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's grace. That's Christ coming to save us when we didn't deserve salvation. That is God sacrificing his son when we did not deserve the sacrifice being made. That's what grace is. And let's just start here by understanding grace is something that is positive. Grace is something that is considered pleasant. It's a pleasant attitude shared between two parties. And we often shorten it when we do lessons on grace by saying it's unmerited favor. It's giving somebody something good that they don't deserve to have. But grace, unfortunately, is also a reminder of something bad. It is a reminder that we don't deserve these things. It is a reminder of, as we read in Romans 5, 8, that God demonstrated his own love towards us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Grace is a reminder that we fail and we cannot save ourselves, as we read this morning in James chapter 2. That's why sometimes when we talk about grace, we tie it very closely to mercy. And to me, the more I think about mercy and grace together, the more I think we have two sides of the same coin. The, the, the coin of grace is the, the heads up side, maybe. The, the, the side that is positive and getting something we don't deserve. Mercy is the negative side of the coin. It's the side of the coin that says, says, we deserve something else, but we didn't get it. We deserved punishment, but instead we were given mercy. And the truth is, is whether you look at grace or mercy, we need both of them. Because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. We need grace. We need mercy. We need both. Of course, there was a time where the churches of Christ at large were accused of not preaching on grace. Or not preaching on grace enough. And, and I've been subject to that accusation, and, and, and maybe you've been subject to that accusation in discussing religion and, and the truths of the Bible with your, your friends and families and colleagues and saying, you know, they just don't talk about grace over there. But we were. And we always had been talking about grace. We may not have used that word a lot, we may not have put up a fancy slide that says seeing grace clearly. We, we may not have talked about it and defined the word as, as we've already done this morning. But when we talk about Jesus Christ, we're talking about grace. He is the embodiment of grace. He is the example of grace. And so while the words may not have been used, if we're telling the story of Jesus and how the love of Jesus can lift us as we sing, we're telling the story of grace. Because the truth is, in looking at grace and his story 
and history and how it all goes together, we see that in the Bible we have grace in the past, grace in the future, and grace in the present. That brings us to 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 3 where it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In these three verses... We see a description of grace given in the past, in the future, and in the present. And so that's going to be our outline for today to talk about Christ and grace and and what we have and what we will have and what we currently have in this very moment. Honestly, when we talk about grace in the past in verse 3, it all starts with, with an origination story. You know, that's popular right now. If you, if you pay attention to the movies right now, we, we're going back to the, the comic book heroes we grew up with, whether it be Batman or Superman or, or X-Men or, or, you know, these various heroes. What are we going back to with the movies right now? Their origination story. Where did it start? Why did they become these heroes? Well, when we talk about grace, there's, a, there's an origination story to that too. And in verse 3, it's given to us, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the origination. That's where it all starts. It starts with God. And it starts with God being who He is. And we can go back to that Old Testament concept as we looked at the Godhead in January and just talk about that, that idea of he is that he is. He is the I am. He's self-existent and he's always existed and always will. God is the basis of grace because God is the basis of everything. That's why it's so amazing That God, who is the basis of everything, who is the I am, who has always existed, can be still called our Father. We can still have that relationship of closeness, that family relationship with this great God. That in of itself is an illustration of grace. That God would allow us to call him Father. And so God is our Father, and as our Father, He gave us a present, a present that that is unimaginable. It is the present of John 3.16. It is the present of Christ coming to this world out of the motivation of love. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God set the plan of grace Christ enacted the plan of grace. And here, if you go to the end of verse 3, it says, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's the action. That, That is the actual action that makes all this grace available is that Christ didn't stay dead. He overcame death by being resurrected. As we read in Colossians 1.18, And he, Christ, is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. He's the firstborn from the resurrected, not meaning in order of things he came first, but meaning that compared to all the other resurrections that have happened or will happen in the future, he is the best He is the first. He is the preeminent of the resurrection. And so what does that do? That gives him authority as the best. You know, if if we want to learn on a subject, you know, whether it be going and hearing a speaker locally or, 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 you know, getting on YouTube and looking for experts on YouTube seems to be the common way to learn things nowadays. You know, if you want to learn something, you go find the preeminent expert. You want to find the best person to listen to. 
If we want to learn about grace, we have to go to the preeminent giver of grace. That is Christ, who when he was resurrected became the preeminent giver of grace, the first and foremost giver of grace. So now in him, we can have grace. See, it's that action of resurrection that originates the availability of grace. Really, when it comes to grace, there's many verses in the Bible that discuss it. And it can discuss it from the standpoint of looking at, at who, what, when, where, and even why, and the how. We get those questions answered about grace throughout the scriptures when we look at the various passages on it. And just in this verse alone, verse 3, we find out who, when, where. We find out these, these origins of the grace we need. Which means that this verse also displays to us the germination of grace. So how did that grow? How did that happen that, that it goes from this action of Christ coming, dying, being buried, and resurrected to now being available to everybody? How does it grow? Well, in the middle of verse 3, it says, Who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope. Again. Mercy. Not getting the punishment we deserve because we have all broken the law. Instead, getting a reprieve from that punishment. It's God's mercy. But God's mercy did more than just save us from the punishment we deserved. God's mercy, in turn, makes us belonging to God. The word used in verse 3 is to be begotten. And there again, go right back to John 3.16. His only begotten son. He is the one that, that Christ is the only one that belongs to God. Well, well, now everybody through Christ and grace can belong to God and that we can now all be begotten of God. We can all belong to him. It's an ownership. See, the thing is, is when someone extends mercy to you, you owe them. You owe them. Now, it may just be very small, and, and we can return a kind favor for a favor, but you know, you read any good uh, uh, fantasy or even history book of the past, and we know if somebody does something good for somebody else, they owe them something. If you save their life, they owe you their life. If you, know, you just help them with a small chore, they help you with a small chore in return. And, and so we see this idea built into history of if someone does something for you, you owe them. Because you have been begotten by them. Well, God gave us everything. And I don't mean the physical blessings of this world. I mean everything that is important is spiritual life. Everything that is important is based in grace and Christ's sacrifice. He gave up the greatest for us. Therefore, we owe him. We are begotten of him. And therefore, that's what's so so amazing about this that changes it from just owing favors to one another to being indebted to one another is God says says yeah they're mine and those people over there I take ownership of them they belong to me he doesn't try to hide the fact that he did this for us and therefore we owe him everything he, he gives us hope through this. He gives us the fact that we can, can have that living hope through Jesus Christ to keep going and belong to him. And, and really what we can do is just see grace as, as a way of transitioning us from where we were to where we need to be. It, back in 1 Corinthians, Paul, Paul writes to the Corinthians a, a, a really surprising verse to me because because it gets them it, to me you know it, it's I, i'm not sure paul set out to kind of write a gotcha verse for them but it's a gotcha verse in first corinthians chapter six because he starts off in verses nine and ten by saying do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of god do not be deceived neither fornicators nor idolaters nor adulterers nor homosexuals nor sodomites nor thieves nor covetous nor drunkards nor revelers nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of heaven 
So they're reading this letter in the public assembly of the church at Corinth and they're going through and they start giving this list of sins saying these people are not going to heaven. These people cannot be part of the kingdom of heaven. And he goes through that list of sin and they're taking him off, taking him off, taking him off, taking him off until he says the gotcha part in verse 11. And such were some of you. Ow, Paul. <laughs> that hurt. Don't tell everybody here I'm one of these things on this list. But that's what Paul is telling them. And you were these sinners. And you did not have heaven and the hope of heaven and the kingdom of heaven in your life. But, see we got you, but we're not going to leave you got. But, you were washed. But, you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. The, the same name and action and person that we get our grace through, it's the same name and action and person that we are washed in so that we can have salvation or be sanctified, or another word for that is to be holy. See, we were sinners, but now by grace we can be saved. Now notice, as Peter is writing chapter 1, verse 3 of 1 Peter to his audience, that this, this, this verse has a lot of past tense. This is what you became. Back somewhere in the past, you became this because you became a Christian. And so, so this is what you became. This is grace in the past, that Jesus in the past did the actions to save us so that we in the past could accept the mercy and salvation that comes with the mercy and become begotten of God. So what does that mean? Well, it means we're, we continue to have grace in the future. Again, looking at verse 4. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. So in the past you accepted grace to have an inheritance. We have an inheritance. And look at the words used in this verse to describe it. This inheritance is incorruptible. Or some versions will say undefiled. And really, when we look at this word, it means it's, it's pure. It's perfect. It's without blemish. It, it's it's clean it's uh, it's you ever run the dishwasher well i'm sure you've run a dishwasher and, and you get done running the dishwasher and it's time to put the plates away and you start putting things away and you you pull that that spoon out you know which one and you go i rinsed it you know and maybe i even wiped it down then i stuck it in the dishwasher and it was supposed to come out clean and you look and there's there's something on it Something's still on that, that spoon. It's not pure and undefiled, even though it's gone through basically three cleanings. Maybe you've seen that commercial, you know. Why do you clean the dishes twice? Because <laughs> I want to make sure it gets clean. But despite that, sometimes it doesn't. Despite our best efforts, the spoon's still dirty. Despite our best efforts, humanity is still dirty. We're still unclean. But we can look forward to what God makes clean. What God sanctifies. What he's washed. What he's made pure. What he's made perfect. Our inheritance is incorruptible. Undefiled. And it does not fade. Now, the image of, of unfading here in this verse is, is simply something drying up. You know, you know whether, whether it be a, a pond with no, no inlet or outlet, eventually it will dry up unless something else gets in there, rainwater or something else, groundwater. But if there's no other source of water and you had a pond at one time, eventually it will fade away. And that's the image given of, of really everything physical. It's all fading away. You know, you, you, 
you buy the brand new item. It can be any a phone, a car, a house. Well, what do they say about cars? Brand new car, you leave the lot, and immediately it's lost its value. <laughs> because it has started its transition to fading away. And it will fade away. A and we can look at, at any object. It fades. But not the things of God. Not the spiritual things, not this inheritance he has given us. And that's why it is all that much more powerful that Christ says back in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, starting in verse 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What Christ is teaching them is, look, you're so caught up in gaining these physical things, but they're all losing value. They are all fading away. But what I offer you is something that will not fade away, an inheritance that will not dry up because it's pure and it's perfect. This inheritance is a location. See, the inheritance we're looking forward to in the future is reserved in heaven for you. Heaven's actually a really interesting word in the Bible to study because of how it's used. It, it, basically, we, we've taken the English word heaven and we've applied it to several words of the Greek and Hebrew language. That's why Paul at one point says, I was called up to the third heaven. And, and in that reference, what he's meaning is the first heaven, according to the Jewish understanding of the world, is what we call the sky. It, it, it's the it's the thing around us that, that, that keeps this earth contained is the atmosphere, the clouds, where the birds fly. That's the first heaven. Beyond that is a second heaven. We call it space. Second heaven's a better name than space. <laughs> it just is. What is that out there? Ah, space. But instead, we have, have the Jewish idea of that's the, the second heavens, the second firmament, and that's where the planets are and the galaxies and the stars and all these wonderful things that God has made for us to observe from the, this rock to see all those other rocks out there. It's not just space. It's beautiful, and it captures our imaginations, and that was the second heaven. That's why it's thought that maybe in, in, in the creation story it says God created the heavens and the earth the multiple heavens of the sky and the space, and then the third heaven. Well, the third heaven is the dwelling place of God, and it's spiritual. And it is, well, it's out of this world. That's our inheritance. We may never personally fly off of this rock. Some people have, and more will, but it may not be us. But we do have an opportunity to go to that third heaven, which is greater than the first and second. It's an inheritance that's been given to us. Actually, the word heaven from, from, from the Greek word that's translated is the concept of being lifted up. It immediately inspires that idea of going up. That's why, why we don't know where this heaven is. What do we always do? Heaven. As opposed to, we think of heaven, <laughs> and we think of up, and lifted up, and we have descriptions all through scripture of physical ideas of what the spiritual place is. And that's the problem, is our, our physical explanations are, are limited compared to how great this heaven's going to be. It's something you do not want to miss. But understand this also. This internal inheritance that we have up in heaven for us, waiting for us, is not earned. When you go back to the words of John 14, Christ tells us, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus went to prepare this place for us 
so that we can have it given to us by grace through what Jesus did. But with that being said, even though we cannot earn heaven, we still have to make a reservation. I find it interesting that later in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 3, it just simply says, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. And in the context, he's saying, here's the things you can have if you will taste the grace of God. And, and that's a lesson in and of itself. If, 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 if you want to ha go have a, a nice meal, you know, I, I hear there was something Friday where people went out for nice meals. Um, uh, well, someone can tell me later, remind me. Uh, but, you know, it, it, maybe you went out to, to dinner that night and, and you wanted to have a nice meal, which means, of course, you're going to have a main course. But if you're going all out, you're going to have an appetizer too. Not just the bread they bring when you show up, but you know, you're, you're going to order something, something special. You're going to get an appetizer. Then you're going to have your main dish. And then, because it's a special night out, you're going to have dessert. You're going to have a three-course meal. It's going to be nice. It's going to be wonderful. Well, here we're being told about grace and saying it's something we need to taste and we need to understand grace is a three-course meal. There's an appetizer to grace. We find it in Acts chapter 20. In Acts chapter 20, verse 32, we read, So now, brethren, I command you to God and to the, the word, of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Did you see it? Our appetizer to grace, this, this meal we're enjoying, is the word of grace. It's the words of God given to us in scripture. It's the word of grace that is the appetizer, how we find out about the, this grace and the things of Christ and God and all these many things. It's where we start with the word of grace. And look what it does which you build upon. See, that's what a good appetizer does. See, see, my problem is, is when I go out to eat on those nice dates and the bread comes and I, I order a drink and, and we order an appetizer and what do you know, there's a salad too. And by the time the meal gets there, I'm ready to skip to dessert because I don't want to miss that. But a true appetizer, a true appetizer gets you ready for the meal to come. Doesn't fill you up. It's just enough to make you go, I want more. And that's what the word of God is for grace. It's that, that starter that gets us ready to want more because we do want the main course. We do want the main dish that is found in John 1.17. In John 1.17, it says, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Grace and truth the main course is Jesus himself. When we take of this feast, not to fill the physical body, but to fill the spiritual, what are we doing? We are taking emblems that represent Christ, emblems that represent his, his body, emblems that represent the blood he shed. That's the main course. It's Christ himself not just in communion, but in that everything we do, whether it's teaching grace, it's not just enough to say you have grace. We have to tell you where it comes from, Jesus Christ. We have to tell you how he gave it to you through his death, burial, and resurrection. That's the main course of grace that, 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 that we are trying to taste of. It is Christ Jesus himself. And when we have that, when we have that, then we get to the point of, Oh, there's more. See, the worst thing restaurants do to me is they have a dessert tray. See, if I can look at a menu and a picture and stuff, I can ignore that. I can, I can ignore, you know, pictures and words. But when they bring a huge tray by and it has various and sundry desserts and about half of them have some type of chocolate in them, which just makes it all that much more tempting, right? You're going to go, oh, there's more. I can't resist that. Well, with grace, oh, there's more. There's dessert. And we find it in 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 16, where it says, now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself 
and our God and Father who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace. Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good work and word. What we have in the desert of grace is God and Christ all that much more with us, establishing us, preparing us for the future, and being there for us in every good work, word and work we do. He's the consolation and he is the hope that we have to receive this grace in the future because we got grace in the past given to us. We look to grace in the future through the hope given to us and the meal it provides for us to realize that right here and right now, we have grace in the present. Verse 5, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Okay, just for review, verse 3, it, it's looking backwards. It has words that look backwards in what you, you have gotten. And then we have looking forward to an inheritance in verse 4. And then we have the present in verse 5 of being kept. K-E-P-T. Kept. I remember as growing up and being fascinated with knights and castles and, and reading that word, keep. Protecting the keep or, or building a, a model, really Legos, of a keep uh, and, and, and having these things. And go, what, what do they mean keep? Why are they calling this castle a keep? Well, because that's what castles were meant to do, to keep people safe. It, it's a concept of being guarded. It's a concept of it being a military garrison. It's a concept given to us in the scripture of God is keeping us in the present, by his power in salvation. See, salvation is not just something we got in the past. It's not just something we have in the future. It's something we have right now. By the power of God, we are being kept in the salvation extended to us. As we read in Romans 1.16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. The word for power in verses 116 of Romans and the word for power in 1 Peter 1, 5 is the same word, deutimos. Eventually, that word is brought over into English and been given to dynamite. But you have to be careful on how much you over apply that. But what we have here is we have a concept of something powerful. And not just that blows stuff up, but that actually, that actually works a whole plan. That's why we don't want to push the illustration too far of dynamite, because dunamos is so much more. Dunamos is what gives us power to, to, to be with God. And so we go back to verse 5, and it says, We are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation. Now, while you can't always definitively say when you're reading through scripture that the word faith should have the in front of it, T-H-E, which makes it a, a very definite article, a definite thing, not just a faith, but the faith that is revealed to us in scripture. We don't always know where the the should be, but in this case, we do know. In this case, we do know. This is talking about the faith, not a faith, not some kind of faith. It's the faith that has been revealed in that meal of grace by the word of God, by the actions of Christ, and by having God with us in the present and into the future. It is the faith that says we are being kept into our salvation. It is not some concept of leaping. It's a concept of concrete faith, the hope, the evidence. It is the faith that keeps us grounded on concrete of where we need to be. And what's so amazing is that concept of being kept, we read again. And this time it's in the words of Jesus in John chapter 17 when he is saying his prayer to God. 
In verse 11, he says, Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you, Holy Father. Keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. See, Christ says the same word that Peter uses to talk about us being in the present in God, being kept in the grace, being kept with Christ. Christ uses the same word and says, I pray, God, keep them. In context, he is specifically pointing to his disciples, but later he does widen this prayer to all believers who come through all generations. And so it's fair to apply that what what Christ would want for his disciples and apostles that are right there, right then, he would want for us too. He would want us to be kept, guarded, safe, and saved. Because it says in verse 5, We are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. We are saved. We are saved to have life. See, when we go back to Romans and we read about the wages of sin in in chapter 6, verse 23, after we've already read, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, we read that harrowing verse, for the wages of sin is death. Don't let the preacher stop there, though. Say, go on, preacher, not literally, but in your mind. Say, go on, preacher, because the verse goes on and says, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, we are saved by grace to receive eternal life, which means we're saved to the end, in the present. As long as we keep living for Christ, we keep living for God, we keep living in that presence. In the present, we have salvation to the end. Read 1 John. Read 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Read Romans 8, 24 and other passages that say when you belong to God, when you accepted his grace in the past because you're looking towards grace in the future, you have grace right now to the end. We have grace, past, future, and present. And so in verse 7, We read that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes through it, it, uh, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Because we have this grace, even though things may be hard sometimes, even though times may be rough, even though there are things out there that will get us down, we can still praise, honor, and glory Because we know Jesus Christ is coming, and we know it's through him we are saved. As we were reminded last week on Sunday night, if we're joyous, if we're a joyous Christian, if we have this grace and this salvation, notify your face. Be happy. Realize what we've been given. Realize how much grace means to us. Because we have so much to rejoice about. Because we have this grace, past future, and present. But we must pause and ask the question, do you have this grace? Have you accepted the gift that Christ gave you by putting your faith in him and leaving the world behind you in repentance and confessing that Christ gives you this grace and based on that confession being baptized for the remission of sins, being washed, as Paul wrote to the Corinthians? And are you living in that grace that grace presently that you still are are in Christ, working for Christ, being there with Christ and having him there with you too. Do you have this grace? Because today could be that past moment you received it so that you have the hope of the future grace and you'll have grace in the present for the rest of your life. If you don't have that grace and we can help you receive it today, let us know. And if we can help you now, please come forward while we stand and sing the invitation song. i hey.